Hi everyone, today we are going to go over chapter 9, which is basically about genetics and how our traits are expressed, the ones that we get from our mom and from our dad. There's some terminology that we need to go over before we even talk about the Punnett squares and genetics. Um, one is character, which is a feature that is inherited. And then, you know, Mendel, Gregor Mendel, which is the father of genetics, he basically studied uh, peas and then their characteristics or characters. So some characters for the pea are the uh, color of the flower, the flower position, um, seed color, seed shape, pod shape, pod color. Okay, so that all pertains to the pea plant. But for us, some characters could be our eye color, our skin color, our hair color, the shape of our eyes, um, the shape of our hands, the shape of our fingers, um, etc. And then trait, the other terminology, um, trait just means that it's just a different version of those characters. So for the pea plant, for the color of flower, um, the trait could be purple color or white color. Okay, um, seed color, it could be yellow or green. Um, the shape of the seed, it could be round or wrinkle, etc. Um, our trait, so for trait for the character of eye color, we can have the trait for brown eye color, we can have the trait for blue eye color, um, whereas the color of our skin, that's a character. It could be that we have the trait for light skin color, dark skin color, um, the shape of our eyes, which is a character. We could have the shape for more almond-eyed shape or more um, rounded shaped. Okay. And then just a review, we do need to know what an allele uh, loci or locus is before we proceed with chapter 9. So this is a different picture from chapter 8, but I really like this picture as well. So here you have a picture of a pair of homologous chromosomes. So you guys remember what homologous chromosomes are? They're basically the same length, okay? Um, we get one from mom, we get one from dad, and then their centromere location is the same. They have the same staining patterns, and then also they have the same genes on the same position of those chromosomes, okay? So the location of genes is called a locus. So locus is singular, loci is plural, more than one. And then on these loci, so here we can say that this is from mom, this is from dad, we have the same genes, okay? So maybe let's suppose that this is the gene for eye color, okay? Its location is right here on these chromosomes. Its uh, loci is right here. However, we can get a different version of those genes, which are called alleles. So maybe, let's say from mom, we can have the allele for blue eye color. And then from dad, we can have the allele for uh, brown eye color. Okay. And then depending on which allele is dominant or recessive, the dominant allele will be the one that um, is expressed most often. And then um, here, you know, this at this loci, we can have the gene that codes for... Uh, hair color, okay? And then here we can see that the alleles are the same. We can have the allele for brown hair color from mom and then the allele for brown hair color from dad. So definitely the offspring will have brown hair color, okay? And then, you know, for here we can say that you know, this gene right here and here at this position can code for the shape of our eyes, okay? And then here we can have the allele for, from mom, um, almond eye shape. And then here we can have the allele for round eye shape from dad.
Okay, so a monohybrid um, cross is just when we are looking at one character. Okay, um, mono means one, and then in the case of Minder, um, Gregor Mendel, he actually looked at the color. He looked at other uh, characters as well, but we're going to focus on the color of the pea plant, the flower color. Okay, and then what he did was that he used Punnett squares to show if these two parents mated, what would be the outcome of the offspring? You know, can we predict what traits the offspring would have and then in what percentages or ratios? Okay, so we have two different alleles that we can get from our parents. We have what's called a dominant allele. And then a dominant allele usually um, means that we can make some kind of pigmentation or, you know, there's some kind of expression. Okay, and then in the case for the color of the flower, um, purple would be our dominant allele. And then these dominant alleles are often written in uppercase form. So for this case, for purple, it would be a capital P, a big P, because we're making the uh, purple um, pigments. The other type of allele that we can get from our parents is called recessive allele. And then this recessive allele is masked by this dominant allele. Because this recessive allele, oftentimes it means that um, it's a lack of pigments or a lack of expression. So in this case, um, for the purple, for the uh, flower color, um, it would be a white flower color. And then these recessive alleles are written as lowercase letters. So in this case, it would be a lowercase p. And then a lot of times, you know, these capital letters and lowercase letters, they look the same. So a lot of times I will underline my recessive allele, my lowercase letter. Um, some instructors like to put a cross over the recessive allele. Um, but, you know, either way is up to you. But it's really important that these two letters are the same letters. Um, it's just that one is uppercase, one is lowercase. Okay. And then we can have different combinations of these alleles. Okay. So we can get one big P, one big P. Okay. So this one big P can come from mom, and this one big P can come from dad. So that we can have two big P's, so two dominant alleles, that would mean that we are homozygous dominant. Homozygous dominant. Homo means the same, two of the same alleles, and then they're both dominant alleles. So if we are homozygous dominant for the flower color, that means we would be purple. Purple. Because here, this dominant allele is purple, this dominant allele is purple, so that's the only color, color we can be. And then another combination that we can um, have uh, is a lowercase p, lowercase p, or two little p's, which um, will code for the white allele, the white trait. So that means we would be white, flower color. And then we would also be homozygous recessive, homozygous recessive. So we can get a little p from mom, a little p from dad to make a white flower color offspring. The third combination we can get is two different alleles. We can get a dominant allele and a recessive allele where this recessive allele can come from dad, this dominant allele can come from mom, so we have two different alleles, hence we are heterozygous. Heterozygous. So hetero means different. And then since we do have one dominant allele, this dominant allele will mask the expression of this recessive allele, so that means our trait What's going to be expressed is the purple flower color. Purple flower color. Okay. So this is just what we had on the previous slide. So let's start doing some Punnett squares, some crosses. 
So what Mendel did is that he took two true breeding parents as the parental generation, um, peak generation, and then true breeding parents, it just means that they only have one type of allele. Okay, so this parent only has one type of allele, which is the dominant allele. So this parent is homozygous dominant. This parent only has one type of allele, the recessive allele. So this parent is homozygous recessive. So true breeding parents can only be homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. And then the parental generation is usually a cross between these two different types of true breeding parents. So we're going to set up our Punnett squares, okay, so it's going to be um, four squares. And then what I like to do is that I like to put the first parent on top and then the second parent on the side. But either way is fine, you can put either parent on either side. It'll You'll still get the same results as far as offspring percentages. So here, this parent, this homozygous dominant parent, they only they can only give one type of allele. So they make this gamete here, this big P, so this is one gamete. And then here, this is another type of gamete. So they only make two gametes. So this is one gamete, this is one gamete of this parent here. And then here from this parent, well, they can only make one type of gamete. They can only give the little p, the recessive allele. So this is one gamete here. This is another gamete here. And then what we're going to do is that we're going to find out the possibilities, you know, for each gamete to mate with each gamete. So here... We're going to cross this P, this big P, with this little P, and the result will go into this box. So this is the offspring result if this gamete mated with this gamete. So we would be big P, little p, heterozygous. Well, what if this parent, I mean, sorry, what if this gamete mated with this gamete? This would be the result if they came together. It would be heterozygous as well. Well, we have to find out if this gamete mated with this gamete to get this result. And then lastly, this gamete mates with this gamete to get this offspring result. And then here we can see that all the offspring possibilities is the same. They would all be heterozygous. Now you'll have to find the genotype and the phenotype. So the genotype, it means that is the actual genetic makeup of the individual. And then it would be the allele makeup, so the letters. Okay, so the genotype ratio for the offspring would be that we didn't have any homozygous dominant. There's no big P, no big P, so that's zero, dot, dot. And then we got four heterozygous, we got four big P, little p in our Punnett squares. But we didn't get any homozygous recessive, little p, little p. So we put a zero. So even though we don't see the possibilities for homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive, we still have to put it in when we write our ratio form. So it's a zero to four to zero ratio. And then after each number, you have to put if it's homozygous dominant, if it's heterozygous, or if it's homozygous uh, recessive. You know, if you only put zero dot dot four dot dot zero, we're not going to know. You know 
what the zero stands for, what the four stands for, what the zero stands for. So you have to write it exactly like this, or you will not get full credit. So that's in ratio form. Well, what about percentage form? Um, we see that it's 100% heterozygous, or big P, little p. Okay, so we have that. Well, we didn't see any homozygous dominant, big P, big P, so we put 0%. We didn't see any homozygous recessive, little p, little p, so that's 0% as well. So that's what we would write for our genotype. And then next, we need to know what the phenotype is. So the phenotype, phenotype means that is the actual physical makeup, what is physically expressed, what you actually see, the um, color of the flower. So here, since the genotype is all the same, heterozygous, we see that each of them has a dominant allele, so that means each of these offspring would be purple. So we would put four purple dot dot, and then we see that zero of the offspring would be white uh, flowered. So that's in ratio form. Let's look at it in percentage form. 100% um, would be purple, and then zero would be white. So depending on the question, it could ask you to write it in ratio form, or it can ask you to write it in percentage form. Okay, so we see that here when we um, have the parental generation, when we have the two true breeding parents mate together, it'll make what's called an F1 generation. So these offspring are considered the F1 generation. Well, what if we made it the F1 generation together? So we have two heterozygotes uh, crossing or mating, okay? We want to be able to see what the outcome of that is. So when we have the F1 generation um, cross mating, what we get is called the F2 generation, which is its offspring. So here, this parent, he can make a gamete that gives the big P allele, or they can make a gamete that has the little p allele, the recessive allele, okay? And then here, this parent can have a gamete that has this big P allele, or he can make a gamete that has, sorry, that has this little p allele. So let's find the possible offspring that these gametes can make. So if this gamete were to fall in love with this gamete, then we would get this offspring, which is homozygous dominant, big P, big P. If this offspring, I mean, if this gamete made it with this gamete, then we would get this offspring. And here, if this were to come together with this, we would get this offspring. If this gamete came together with this gamete, we would get this offspring, okay? So these are the possibilities of the types of offsprings we can get. Let's see what their ratio is for the genotype. So here, based on this Punnett square, we see that we can get one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, and then one homozygous recessive. Let's write that in percentage form. So 25% would be homozygous dominant, 50% would be heterozygous, and then 25% would be homozygous recessive. So all these percentages, they equal up to 100%. The ratios equal up to four because there's four uh, possibilities. So that's your genotype. Let's look at the phenotype. 
Well, how many of them will be purple? This one would be purple. This one would be purple. This one would be purple. This one would be white. So that means three of them would be purple and then one would be white. So it'd be a three to one ratio. Three purple dot dot, one white. Well, what about percentages? Well, if all of these three would be purple, that's 75% purple and then 25% white. And then you can also write it in um, fraction form. So here, 3 fourths would be purple, and then 1 fourth would be white. Okay, so do not get these terminologies mixed up, genotype and phenotype. Genotype is the genetic makeup, um, it's the alleles, the letters. And then phenotype is what is physically expressed, is the trait that you see. And then the more Punnett squares you um, do practice, the easier it gets. And then sometimes you, you'll look at a word problem and you probably don't even need to do a Punnett square. And you would know the result. Okay, so in your lab manual, there's some pages that you're going to have to do in lab this week to help you with Punnett squares, to help you with chapter 9. Um, let's do one of them together, so page 107 in your lab manual. Why don't you guys take a few minutes and try to do um, this one. basically look like. Okay, so short fingers, capital S, are dominant over long fingers, lowercase s. This is the recessive allele. Beth, who has long fingers, marries Ken, who is homozygous for short fingers. The first step is to find Beth's genotype. So Beth here in this problem says that she has long fingers. Well, long fingers is recessive, so she needs both of these recessive alleles to be long fingers, to have long fingers. And then Beth, the only type of gamete that she can make is one that has little s and little s. So here, these are her possible gametes, little s, comma, little s. And then it's very important that you put the comma when you're talking about possible gametes. Um, if you don't, it'll just look like a, a genotype. And then our next parent, Ken, says that he is homozygous for short fingers. So short fingers is dominant. So he's homozygous for this. So he has two big S's, two big S's. He is homozygous dominant. Um, for short fingers. So that means he has short fingers. And then the only type of gametes that he can make is one with big S and then another one with big S. So his possible gametes are big S, comma, big S. And then now let's do the Punnett squares to see what type of offspring um, this mating will come to. So here this is Beth's genotype, we cross it with Kin's genotype. So her possible gametes, little s and little s, his possible gametes, big S, big S. And then we can see the results of the Punnett square that the only type of children that they can make are heterozygous or heterozygotes, where each will have um, one big S and one little, one little s. So when we write the genotypic ratio, we can write four big S, little s, so four heterozygotes. And then we still need to write down, even though we don't see it, the homozygous dominant and the heterozygous, dom uh, heterozygous recessive. So zero homozygous dominant, 
to four heterozygotes to zero homozygous recessives. It is pointless, it's pointless to write a ratio that only has four heterozygotes. heterozygotes. And then next, we need to find out what the phenotypic ratio is. So here, since each of them will have a dominant allele for short fingers, um, we get four short fingers to zero long fingers. So it's a four to zero ratio. And it's very important that you put a uh, short and, or, and then long afterwards. Because if you just put four to zero, it's going to be four short to zero long. No, it's going to be four long to zero short. So it's important to put four short dot dot zero long. Based on Gregor Mendel's exper experiments, he um, had four hypotheses. And then, you know, we already know these four hypotheses based on what we know about monohybrid cross, um, about Punnett squares, and even from chapter eight. So we already know what alleles are. We know that, you know, they're alternate forms of a gene or different forms of a gene or different versions of a gene or variant um, versions of a gene. Okay, you know, we can have the allele for brown eye color, or we can have the allele for um, red hair color. And then we already know that we get two alleles for each character. So for the character of hair color, we know that we can get the allele for um, from mom, the allele for brown hair color. We know that we can get the allele for red hair color from dad for a total of two alleles. And then we also already know that, you know, these dominant recessive alleles, we can have different combinations of these alleles. They can be homozygous dominant. They can be homozygous recessive or they can be heterozygous. And then if they are heterozygous, we already know that it's the dominant allele that will be expressed. It's the dominant allele that will mask the expression of that recessive allele. So ultimately, it's the dominant allele that will determine um, what's physically expressed. It'll determine the phenotype of the individual. And then this fourth one, well, we already know that alleles could be dominant or recessive. Okay, so we talked about monohybrid crosses where you are looking at one character and then here, for the dihybrid cross, we are actually looking at two characters. And then for Gregor Mendel, he looked at the shape of the pea seed, where round is dominant and wrinkled is recessive. And then he also looked at another character, which is color of the seed. It could be yellow, that is dominant, or it could be green, that is recessive. And then so for his experiment, what he did is that he, um, for his parental generation, he took two true breeding parents for both characters. So homozygous dominant for the shape and color, homozygous recessive for the shape and color. So for this parent, this homozygous dominant parent, this true breeding parent, this parent will be round and yellow. This homozygous recessive parent, this true breeding parent, will be wrinkled and green. 
And then how do you find the possible gametes of each parent? What are these arrows trying to tell you? Okay, well, let me show you. So to find the first gamete of this parent, what you're going to do is take this big R with this first Y, which is a big Y. That's the first gamete, big R, big Y. And then the second gamete, you take the same R and then you pair it with the next Y which is going to be big R, big Y. So we're finished with that R. Now the third gamete, you take the next Y, I mean, sorry, you take the next R, and then you pair it with the first Y. That's the third gamete. And then here, you take that same R, and then you pair it with the next Y, which is the fourth gamete, big R, big Y. So I'll give you guys a minute to try to find the possible gametes for these two parents. So this is what it's basically going to look like. So here, this is the first parent, this is the second parent. Um, <clears throat> using the same, you know, setup with the arrows um, to find the first gamete of the this first parent, we take this big R, this first R, and then we'll put it with this big Y. So big R, big Y, the same R, but with the second Y. So big R, little Y. That's the second gamete. So we're finished with that R. Now another possible gamete, a different combination, we can have little r with big Y. So here, little r, big Y. And then the same r can pair up with this little y. So little r, little y. So these are the four possible gametes, different um, types of gametes that this parent can make. And then you can see that this is the same um, homozygous recessive parent as before. So th these are the types of gametes that that parent will make. And then if you do want to find out and kind of, you know, further your knowledge about Punnett squares, you can go ahead and complete it, but you won't be tested on it. And then what I usually do is that I write down the possible phenotypes and make a tally of each. So for each offspring that will have one big R, one big Y, that means that they will be round and yellow. If they have one big R and just y, little Ys, then they would be round and green. If they just have little Rs and one big Y, they would be wrinkled and yellow. If they just have little Rs, little Ys, they would be wrinkled and green. So here you can see that these Offsprings will be the same, these will be the same, these will be the same, these will be the same. And then here, we see that since these offsprings, they have one big R, one big Y, that means that they will be round and yellow. So I'll put four tallies, tally marks. Here, this one has um, big R, little Ys, they're all the same, big R's, little Y's. So big R, little Y's, they would be round and green. So I put four tally marks. Here, all they have are little R's and then one big Y, little R, big Y. They would be wrinkled and yellow. So I put four tally marks. And then here, they only have little R's, little Y's. So they would be wrinkled in green, so I put four tally marks. So the ratio for this uh, Punnett square would be four to four to four to four ratio. But in mathematics, we sometimes will reduce it to one to one to one to one ratio. So here, test cross. It's just like a backwards way of finding out. Um, first, you try to find out what the offsprings are, and then that will help determine what the um, 
parent is, the genotype of the parent. So this is when we do a mating with a parent that we don't know what the genotype is with another parent that is homozygous recessive. So the other parent, the known parent, has to be homozygous recessive. So take, for example, in a dog's, their fur color. So black is dominant. Chocolate color is recessive. Here, what are the two possible genotypes that a black fur dog could be? Well, they can be homozygous dominant with big B, big B, or heterozygous, big B, little b, and still have black fur color. Well, we're going to do those two possibilities and mate that pos those possibilities with a homozygous recessive dog that is little b, little b. Okay, so now if the parent is homozygous dominant, we'll put here, and then we're going to mate that with a homozygous recessive. We see that when we do, when we complete the Punnett square, all the offspring would be, would have black fur color, would be heterozygous, and have black fur color. So based on the results of the offspring, if all the offspring, every single one of them, 100% of the offspring has black fur color, that means that parent is most likely homozygous dominant. Well, what happens if the unknown parent is heterozygous? Well, we take this genotype and we cross it with the homozygous recessive and then this is the results that we get for the offspring. So there's a 50% chance that the offspring would be heterozygous and have black fur color. And then a 50% chance that the offspring would be homozygous recessive with chocolate fur color. Now, if in that litter, even if there's one puppy that has brown fur color, that means that the unknown parent is heterozygous for fur color. So basically in a test cross, we're using the results of the offspring to determine what the genotype is of the unknown parent. It's like working backwards. Okay, so next we're going to talk about is recessive disorders and um, dominant dis disorders. And then the disorders that we have, um, that we talk about, that's in your book and that is on this video are the ones that you are going to be responsible for knowing. It's important that you know exactly which disorders are recessive and which disorders are dominant because based on if it's recessive or dominant, they can have carriers and then the result uh, could be different. Okay. So these recessive disorders, they are on the autosome chromosome, okay? So you guys remember what autosomes are? Those are the chromosomes that are not sex chromosomes, okay? So these defective alleles are on these autosomal chromosomes. And then these recessive alleles, um, these recessive disorders, the individual needs to be homozygous recessive to be affected. They need to be homozygous recessive. That means that they need to have two recessive alleles, which are the two defective alleles to express symptoms of that disorder. And then most of the disorders that you find that are genetic are mostly recessive disorders. Most of them are recessive disorders. And then here, take for example, deafness is a, an example of recessive disorder. Now, if the individual is homozygous dominant, 
that means the individual is normal. They can hear. Completely normal. Because they have two good alleles. Here, if the individual is homozygous recessive, like we said before, then that person would be deaf. They would have the, the they would have the recessive disorder. They would be affected. Now, if the individual is heterozygous, where they have one big D, one little d, that means they are a carrier of that disorder. It means that they can still hear. They would, you know, in fact, be normal, but they are a carrier of this one defective allele, of this recessive allele. So these carriers, they could pass down that defective allele to their offspring and not know it because they appear to be normal. They are normal, but they're just carriers. So here, take for example, what happens if two carriers were to mate with each other, two heterozygous were to mate with each other? So here's from the dad, from the mom, possible gamete, possible gamete, possible gamete, possible gamete. Well, you'll have one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, two carriers, and then a 25% chance that your child will be deaf. But you'll have a 75% chance that your child will be will be able to hear. And then I do want to mention that each child is an independent event. That means that you have to do the Punnett square again for each child. Uh, Punnett square doesn't mean that three children will be able to hear and one child won't be able to hear. It just means that for one child, you will have 75% chance that the child will be able to hear and then a 25% chance that the child will be deaf. And then for your next child, you will have to do another Punnett square, which is going to be the same thing. So here, you know, these two parents who are carriers, well, what happens if that 25% chance were to be expressed, that child became deaf, is deaf? then the parents are going to look at each other, well, we're not deaf, and then, but they pass down those defective alleles to that child. And then in this case, if this child were to be born instead, this child could potentially pass down that defective allele later on. At a situation where one parent is deaf, they're homozygous recessive, and one parent is a carrier, where they are heterozygous. So here we see that there's a 50% chance that the child could be a carrier, but your odds for having a child that is deaf increases. So now it's 50% chance. So for a deaf parent to have a child that's able to hear, they would need to mate with a person that is homozygous dominant. So here, this person is homozygous dominant where they are not a carrier, where they are com completely normal, and then they mate with a person that is deaf. All their children, 100% of the time, will be carriers. They will be able to hear. But eventually, you know, this child, these child, they will be able to um, mate and then they will pass down either this gene or this allele or this allele. So they're still carriers of that defective um, allele. So in this situation here, it would seem that the trait for deafness has skipped a generation. Okay, so here, you know, in this parental generation, 
there is deafness, and then their offspring, the next generation, um, deafness has uh, skipped a generation, but it can come back depending on what this carrier, who this carrier mates with. So for these recessive disorders, you'll actually see that it can skip generations, and it'll seem like the trait has disappeared from the um, family tree, but it hasn't. And then this is why sometimes you don't know what um, is being passed down because these traits, they can skip generations. So besides deafness, there is cystic fibrosis. Um, that is a disorder where you can have thick mucus, uh, thick mucus build up in your lungs. Now, these people, they have a defective chloride channel. Okay, and then that chloride channel is important for water movement. So since there's not much water movement in your in their lungs, they have a buildup of thick mucus, and then this thick mucus is a great environment to harbor bacterial infections. So these patients that have a CF, they're often in the hospital um, with bacterial infections on antibiotics on ventilators in and out of the hospital, lethargic. Um, currently, there's no cure for it, but they're working on it with um, gene therapy. And then your next one is um, albinism. This is when the disorder um, doesn't allow the patient, the individual, to make pigments. And then these pigments, they're missing from their skin, their hair, their eye. So if they're missing pigment, melanin, that means that they can't really go into the sun. They're very sensitive um, to the sun. So their quality of life has declined. And then Tay-Sachs um, disorder, a recessive disorder, is when these people are missing an enzyme that is critical for breaking down um, a type of fatty protein in the brain. And then if that enzyme is missing, they can't break down those fatty proteins in the brain. It builds up, and then this can interfere with seeing their sight, hearing, um, motor movements, um, mental development. So their quality of life is not great. And then, of course, sickle cell anemia, that's another recessive disorder. This, you know, we've talked about, and then we're going to talk about some more in a little bit. So here we know that uh, sickle cell anemia is where your red blood cells are kind of like a crescent, a sickle cell shape. And then when this happens, um, oxygen can't be delivered to their tissues, to their cells. And then you get like a slew of uh, health problems. And then one way I like to remember, oh, you know, all of these are types of recessive disorders is deaf cats. Deaf cats. But feel free to use whatever mnemonic um, that will help you. Okay, so your next type of disorder is um, our dominant disorders. And then these occur on the autosomes as well. So for these dominant disorders, what usually happens is that um, it usually occurs in embryonic death or miscarriages, okay? And then especially if the individual is or the offspring is homozygous dominant. So that means that they have two defective alleles and then this embryo didn't have a chance to live, didn't have a chance to develop. So that would end up in a miscarriage. But if the individual is heterozygous where they only have one dominant allele and then the other one is recessive, they will express the dominant disorder trait symptoms. They are affected. And an example is achondroplasia. 
So achondroplasia is a type of dwarfism. There's um, other types of dwarfism. This is only one type. And then so for a person to be to be dwarf um, size or to have achondroplasia, they would have to be um, heterozygous. So that means that everyone else that is of normal stature or of normal height, what would have to be their genotype? They would have to be homozygous recessive. They would have to be little a, little a to be normal height, normal stature. So mini me from Austin Powers, bless his soul, um, he had a chondroplasia. So we know what his genotype is, which is heterozygous. And then Tyrion Lannister from Game of Thrones has a chondroplasia, which his genotype is heterozygous, big A, little a. Now let's take a look at here if we have one parent that does have a chondroplasia, so they're heterozygous. This is a possible gamete. This is a possible gamete of that affected parent. And then they mate with a normal parent and unaffected parent, where here this is one gamete of them and one gamete of them. So the parent too has to be homozygous recessive. So when we finish the Punnett square, we see that there's a 50% chance that the offspring can have a chondroplasia or 50% chance that the offspring can uh, be of normal stature, normal height. And then some other disorders that are dominant, um, something that's called Huntington's disorder and then Huntington's disorder the symptom the onset of symptoms usually occurs in the 30s or 40s um, when you know they're that old and then what happens is that your motor skills um, is a neurodegenerative disease where your motor skills progressively decline and then what you see is that they'll have uh, you know, spasms, and then <clears throat> they'll have their arms flailing, it's all uncontrollable, and then, you know, a simple tasks of brushing their teeth or shaving a beard, um, combing their hair becomes pretty much impossible as this disorder progresses. Um, if you get a chance, please, you know, look up videos or some literature about Huntington's. There's no cure for it either, unfortunately. There's treatment that will help um, their quality of life, but it's a progressive disorder. So the onset of symptoms can come later in their life, in their 30s or 40s, but it can also have juvenile onset where it comes um, earlier, you know, where the individual is only about 20 years old. And if that's the case, the dis disorder is more progressive, is more aggressive. And then since this disorder comes later in life, if the person has made it already or has had a child, they didn't know that they had this disorder and then they passed it down to their offspring. There's a chance that they could have passed um, that defective allele to their offspring. And then... But now these days, there's um, genetic testing that will allow you to see if you have um, certain types of disorders or your um, embryo has that disorder. The next one I think everybody's heard of is Alzheimer's. Um, this is a neurodegenerative disease as well where you get dementia. And it's pretty... Sometimes it can be aggressive and sometimes it's not. But the thing about Alzheimer's is that it's um, heartbreaking for the individuals affected because, you know, they, the patient may not even know that they are family or, you know, friends or um, any kind of relationship. 
some days are good, some days are bad. And then, of course, it's heartbreaking to see uh, for the individual that has Alzheimer's that they're frustrated, that they know that there's something wrong with them, but um, they can't express it. So Alzheimer's, there's a familial component to it, and of course there's an environmental component of it. And then achondroplasia, which, which we talked about. So these three, if they are homozygous um, dominant, most likely results in a miscarriage. But if they are uh, heterozygous um they are viable, but they're effect affected. Now here, polydactyly, this dominant disorder, poly means many, dactyly means digits. This is when you get more than five toes or five fingers on a limb. Okay, so here, this disorder isn't really detrimental. Um, it really doesn't have an effect on your mental capabilities or, you know, cognitive or uh, motor skills. Um, a little bit of, you know, movement, but not anything too terrible. So you can just have basically surgery and just, you know, cut these extra fingers off or toes off. So this polydactyly, um, these people can actually be homozygous dominant and still be okay and still be viable and the embryo can live on and, um, you know, be born. Here, this is another way to remember that uh, these are your dominant disorders, H-A-A-P, HAP. Okay. So what we've been basically talking about is what's called complete dominance, but you do have situations where something that's called incomplete dominance, where you get the expression of both alleles, but when they're expressed, it's not equal. It's not the same amount. And then what you get is what's called an in-between phenotype, or kind of in the middle phenotype or an intermediate phenotype. And then this happens when in heterozygotes. So when you have a dominant allele and a recessive allele together. In a normal situation, that dominant allele will completely mass over that recessive allele. But in incomplete dominance, you have some expression of the dominant allele and then some expression of the recessive allele. So you get kind of like a hybrid phenotype. And then you can see these in flowers, so carnation, roses, uh, snapdragons, and then of course hair uh, texture or waviness of hair. So here in the snapdragon, we take a red homozygous dominant snapdragon flower, and then a white snapdragon homozygous recessive, okay? And then if you do the Punnett square, or you can already see how the Punnett square is going to look like, you get a hybrid. You get an in-between phenotype of the heterozygote, where some of the dominant allele expresses and some of the recessive allele expresses, to get a pink color, a pink color. So that's your F1 generation. And if you mated your F1 generation together to get your F2 generation here, so here you can get a 25% chance that the red color comes back. You get a 25% chance that the um, white color comes back, but 50% chance the flower will be pink. And then that pink is a result of the incomplete dominance, the heterozygotes. Another type of inheritance is called codominance. And then a really good example of codominance is your blood cells, what type of blood you have. So for blood, there's three possible alleles. I know we've been just talking about two alleles, but sometimes um, for certain genes, there's three possible alleles. 
So your blood type is based on what type of carbohydrate is on the surface of your red blood cells. So for type A people, they have the uh, carbohydrate A around their red blood cells. So these are type A. And then type A can be written in different ways. So here in your book, you'll see that it's written as I, and then superscript big A, I, superscript big A. So for this person to have type A blood, they need two of these dominant alleles. Okay, and then the way the reason why your book puts it, or you know, a lot of textbook puts it. Um, the I is, it represents the enzyme that puts the A carbohydrates on this red blood cell. Okay, so they have to be homozygous dominant, or they can be heterozygous to have type A blood. So here, I, superscript, big A, and then this little I represents the missing um, enzyme. So that's representing the recessive allele. So another way to write it, a much simpler way to write it, is that type A people can be homozygous dominant with two big A's, or heterozygous, where they have one dominant allele, A, and one recessive allele, O, And then here for people type B, they put a different type of carbohydrate on their red blood cells. So it could be written like this, where it's homozygous dominant for B, or heterozygous for B, so BO. So that based on this, your a and B are co-dominant, okay? And then you do have type AB blood, where you have the type A carbohydrates and type B carbohydrates. So that means that this person is AB blood, and this A allele and this B allele are co-dominant where they are expressed equally. And then the fourth phenotype, the fourth blood type, is O blood. And then these O blood people, they actually don't have any carbohydrates on their red blood cells. So that means that they are homozygous recessive. They do not have enzymes to put carbohydrates on um, their red blood cells. So they are O, O, type O blood, two or homozygous recessive alleles. And then this picture is a great picture um, just because it kind of shows you how blood types work. So here, if you are type A blood, you have the uh, carbohydrate A or antigen A on your red blood cells. And then you can only receive blood from type A people because they have the same type of carbohydrates on their uh, red blood cells, and people who are O type, because these people do not have any carbohydrates on their red blood cells. That means that these people's immune system will not see that as foreign. Now, it means that these people cannot receive blood from people who are type B blood because they'll see that carbohydrate B as foreign and then they'll make antibodies against those carbohydrates. So, or they cannot donate to, so these people also can't receive blood from people who are, um, type B blood. But type A people can donate to type A. 
That's good. Also, they can donate to people who are type A B blood, because since this person has A carbohydrates, the same as this person, it's okay. And then here, if we skip, so people who have type A B blood, they are considered universal recipients. They can receive people from type A, type B, type AB, and type O. So they can receive from type A because they have type A on their blood. They can receive from type B because they have B on their blood. And then of course this is the same as them. And then type O where they don't, these people don't have any carbohydrates. So there's nothing to for the immune system to attack. But these people can only donate to their same kind. You know, this AB, they cannot donate to people with type B blood because these people will see the A carbohydrates on them and will attack. These people can't donate to type A blood because these people will see the B carbohydrates and will attack. Now here, these people who are type O blood, they are considered universal donors. So since they don't have any antigens or they don't have any carbohydrates on the surface of their red blood cells, um, there's nothing to attack. So that means that they can donate to everyone. But they can only receive blood from their same kind. Now these people with O type blood, they can't receive blood from type A because they're gonna see these A carbohydrates and attack. They can't receive B blood because they're going to see these carbohydrates and attack. They can't receive blood from AB because they're going to see these carbohydrates and attack. The next type of um, pattern of inheritance is what's called pleiotrophy. And then, so this is kind of like a domino effect. So this one is where one gene can control multiple or many characteristics, okay? So here, this one gene, it has an effect on multiple traits. And then a really good example is your sickle cell disease. So remember, sickle cell disease is when um, your red blood cells, they become that sickle, sh uh, sickle shape. It's because that hemoglobin protein crystallizes and it becomes that crescent shape. So when it becomes that crescent shape, it can't deliver, it doesn't have the right shape to deliver the oxygen to your tissues, to your cells. And then you get this domino effect where you can have all these multiple health problems. Um, so here, if there, these sickle cells aren't the right shape, okay, you have a breakdown of your red blood cells, and then you can get these symptoms. And then, or you can also, you can have um, kind of a clogging of your blood vessels. So your blood vessels are circular in diameter, and then your red blood cells, well, they're supposed to be circular in diameter and supposed to flow smoothly through your blood vessels. Well, if your red blood cells are the sickle shape, crescent shape, they can't flow smoothly through the blood vessels, and then what you get is like clumping or gathering or, you know, clogging and blocking of your blood vessels. And then you get these symptoms here. And then your spleen is responsible for breaking down your red blood cells. 
But if there's too many of these sickle cell, red blood cells, you can get these symptoms. So you can see by this diagram, you know, um, just because you are homozygous for the sickle cell uh, disease, you get this one gene will cause these multiple traits. The next pattern is called polygenic inheritance. And then here, this is kind of like the opposite of pleiotrophy, where many genes will actually affect one character, one trait, one phenotype. And then a really good example is your skin color. <clears throat> So your skin color is actually controlled by three genes, and you can have a total of six alleles. So remember, two alleles per gene. And then here, you know, the dominant alleles are considered the units of pigment. So the more dominant alleles you have, the darker you are. And then those recessive alleles, the more recessive alleles you have, the, um, the lighter your skin color is. So here for this um, skin color, your dominant alleles are incompletely dominant over uh, your recessive alleles. Okay. So here for this chart, um, you know, a person that is extremely dark, well, their genotype, they have six units of pigments or six dominant alleles. Whereas a person that is extremely light, they are all homozygous recessive and don't have any units of pigment. And then a person that is um, an intermediate or in the middle skin color, well, they have three dominant alleles, three recessive alleles, so they have three units of pigment to make up their skin color. And then you can see that in here, um, since there's three genes, it's more of a 64 Punnett square problem. But you don't have to worry about that. And then for this polygenic inheritance, there's supposedly seven different types of phenotypes that can occur. And then these polygenic inheritance, the way to identify them, um, what types of genes or what trait um, falls into polygenic inheritance is if there's a spectrum of it or a gradation of it. So for skin color, there's a wide spectrum of different skin color. Um, other examples can include human height, Okay, there's many genes that will affect human height, um, genes that control development, um, genes that control how your muscles grow, how your bones grow. Um, gene that controls uh, growth hormone. So there's a spectrum of the different heights that we can have. There's a spectrum of different eye colors. So yes, you know, people, a lot of people have brown eye color, but there's different shades of brown. There's dark brown eye color, there's medium eye brown color, there's light eye brown color. So if you have eye, uh, brown eye color, you know, take a look in the mirror and see, you know, um, what variation of brown do you have versus another person's brown eye color. And then weight is another um, trait that's controlled um, by polygenic inheritance. There's many genes controlling height. You have um, genes for your thyroid hormone, growth hormone, metabolism, etc. Hair color. You know, a lot of people have brown hair color, but there's different shades of brown. And then, of course, dog coat color. So those are just some examples of um, polygenic inheritance. Okay, I have a question for you. 
which disorder is a recessive disorder? We actually talked about this twice. So a hint is deaf cats. Your answer is sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia. What characteristic is the result of polygenic inheritance? Think about a spectrum of phenotypes. So we have hair color, hair color. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about is something that's called sex link genes. Um, you have your sex chromosomes, you have your X, and you have your Y chromosome. So do you notice how the X chromosome is much larger than the Y chromosome? So that means that this X chromosome has a lot of genes has many more genes than on the Y chromosome. So that's why we say that these sex-linked genes are sometimes referred to as X-linked genes, X-linked genes, because a lot of the disorders are on this X chromosome. So your sex chromosomes, they have a lot of genes that pertains to secondary sex um, characteristics like, you know, for females, um, you know, breast size, fat depos deposits, um, amount of, you know, less hair, um, you know, our facial features, um, males, um, you know, the amount of testosterone, um, the amount of um, beard, um, the amount of muscle, uh, secondary uh, sex characteristics. But on your sex chromosomes also, there's genes that are not related to secondary sex characteristics. And then sometimes you can have defective alleles on these genes. And then one example is red-green color blindness. Okay. So red-green color blindness. So sex-linked genes, um, to get these disorders, the... Um, it's a little bit different. For females, you have to be homozygous recessive. But for males, you only need one defective allele to be affected. So here, these Punnett squares, these, um, these genotypes are written a little bit differently because it occurs on the sex chromosomes. So here, the father who has normal vision, okay? So that means that he is XY. And then since color blindness happens on the sex chromosome, we only put it on the sex on the X chromosome. And here, capital C, this dominant allele, that's the normal allele. So here's a possible gamete of the father. Here's a possible gamete of the father. So since he has a dominant allele, he can see normal. Here, the mother, she is a carrier, so she is heterozygous. So she has a dominant allele and a recessive allele. So the possible gamete that she can make is this X with the dominant allele, and then this X with the recessive allele. And then when you complete the Punnett square, you can see that this daughter has is homozygous dominant, so she is okay. This son received the dominant allele from the mother because the mother gives the X to the son, he is normal. He can see normally. This daughter received a dominant allele from the father, recessive allele from the mother. She is heterozygous, but she is okay. But she is a carrier. So since we know that the sex-linked 
um, disorders are recessive disorders, we see that carriers, this, we see that heterozygotes are carriers. Now, if we didn't know that red-green colorblindness was recessive and we thought that red-green colorblindness was dominant, we would see this heterozygote as being affected. But that's not the case. So that's why it is um, a good idea to remember which disorders are recessive and which disorders are um, dominant. And then here, this son, he received the Y from the father because he needs a Y to be a male. But here, he received the defective allele from his mother, this recessive allele. So that means that this son is colorblind and affected. So males, they only need one defective allele to be affected, and they get it from the mother. So these sex-linked disorders, they will often occur in males, more in males than in females. And to better explain that, so here, um, hemophilia is another example of sex-linked disorders where if you have the dominant allele that's normal, where you can clot normally, but if you have the recessive allele, that's the defective allele, and then that's where you are not able to clot um, in an appropriate time period. So here, in this Punnett square, we can see that the female is a carrier, where this x is a normal x, dominant x. This x is a recessive x. And then the father, he does have hemophilia because it's on that X chromosome. He has that recessive X and he has a normal Y. So if these two parents mated, this daughter will be normal. This daughter, however, would be affected with, hem with hemophilia because she received a recessive allele from the mother, a recessive allele from the father. So for females to be affected, they need to be homozygous recessive. They need to have two defective recessive alleles, from one from both parents. Where, so that's a little harder than a male where a male only needs to have one defective allele. And then, so we talked about red-green color blindness is an example. Hemophilia is an example. Another example is something that's called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And this is when you um, are missing a protein that will help maintain and repair muscles. So that means that they have a progressive um, uh, muscle degeneration problem. And then they eventually, you know, end up in a wheelchair. And then, you know, they eventually are not able to be very mobile. And then this doesn't have a cure as well. And they're also working on gene therapy to help cure this disorder. Um, and another disorder is male pattern baldness. So we, we've all heard of male uh, pattern baldness. So this, you know, you always look at the dad's um, female side. <clears throat> so if, you know, this dad, if this person, this, you know, he got his defective allele from his mom.
Okay, so for this chapter, it's a little bit more difficult. It's more application problems. You're on your test. You're going to have many Punnett squares, little Punnett squares, where you're gonna have to, you know, maybe show your Punnett squares, or you know, you're gonna have to know how to do the Punnett squares to get the results, the answer. And then please do finish those um, Punnett squares in your lab manual. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me or make an appointment with me and we can go over um, anything you want.